Welcome to Care Talk at Health 2019, a special edition of interviews here from the Health Innovation Conference in Las Vegas. I'm David Williams, president of Health Business Group, here with my co-host John Driscoll, CEO of CareCentrics. And today we have our guest, Marcus Osborne. He is VP of Health and Wellness Transformation at Walmart. Welcome, Marcus. Thanks for having me. So, Marcus, tell us a little bit about the fact that, that Walmart's now going to take over primary care. You've got a clinic start opening in Georgia. Is this, is this sort of the beginning of something very large in primary care? Walmart getting into that business? Well, I'd actually say two things. One is, I mean, certainly, you know, Walmart doesn't do anything that we don't intend to do at scale. So, uh, to be clear, as we look at opportunities, we look at them and say, how can we serve as many people as we possibly can? I think that said, what we're doing in Georgia, I, I, we call it a test, and it's a test not to determine whether this is a business we want to be in, but it's a test to determine, can we get the model right? And so it really is a test to learn. Um, so it, with the intention of saying, can this be a business that's sustainable, that can scale? I think the other thing that I would sort of tell you is, I, I think a lot of people actually don't really kind of entirely know or understand what we've done in Georgia. I think a lot of people say they define it as a primary care clinic. It's, it's not a primary care clinic. I mean, one of the kind of funnier things about it is, it is an 11,000 square foot space that houses a full array of health services. It's as big as a CVS. Really? And 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 what it actually is doing, what the- Who's the, CVS? Who is, that's a good question. Uh, consumer value stores. Yes, uh, but they, uh, but you, you look at it, and so I think you think about, it's not that we just put a broad array of services, primary care, labs, imaging, behavioral health, which has been a huge component of it, uh, vision, hearing, uh, dentistry, but it's actually the it, when you go into it and see, we actually integrated them. These these are groups who heretofore you really you don't you never really see dentists and primary care physicians and behavioral health specialists and audiologists ever having to work together. We actually shoved them into the same space, and so there's, there were, we're making them kind of find new ways to work together to the to the betterment of the consumer. The rationale, quite frankly, is if you can do it and do it well, there's some efficiencies gained from the scope of services, from, from the breadth of services. In much of the same way you see that in our super center, because we sell food and general merchandise, we actually get, we get advantages of scale there. But the second thing is, we're now starting to see the ty a type of care that uh, customers didn't really anticipate. Sort of whole person care? Is that, yeah, I mean, is that, you, how would you think of how well, would you describe it? I'll, I'll, I'll tell you, I mean, I'll give you an interesting quick story that just popped up the other day. It was um, that we, we heard about a strange interaction between a patient who had gone in to see the dentist and the court, they were having a filling done. And the dentist noticed in the course of them doing that filling that, um, that this patient couldn't hear him. Uh, because he noticed that we went in to do the drill, the guy jumped really quick, and he said, I just told you that I was coming yeah. in, was, there, was that painful? He said, no, I didn't know you were doing it. He said, I told you a couple of times I was doing it, and he realized when he was on the side of the guy, the guy couldn't hear him. And so he said, I have, do you have a hearing issue? Have you ever had that done? And with, next thing you know, the guy's down sure. getting a hearing test, sure. getting hearing aids, and you think about that type of, I, recognizing they're there to address the full health needs mm -hmm. of that individual, and so I think that that really is the ambition. Can you can you bring together that sort of full, a much broader scope than anybody ever anticipated could be done at retail, and get them to kind of work together in a way to deliver uh, care for that individual and a care for their family that we've never seen before. You know, Marcus, one of the, one of the things yeah. that's uh, you know I think about Walmart and I think about something that's at scale, as yeah. you said. And I want to ask about that in a minute, but also inexpensive. And I saw the price list, yeah. and those prices look like. Copay prices are, are lower. What I mean, how low are the prices, and is that is that how for low real? can you go? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, I mean, like single digit prices. Well, we got uh, well on, on most of them. If you look at it, say forty dollars for a core primary care visit, forty five. Not the copay. Uh, not the that's copay. That's the whole price. That's if you, it doesn't matter if you're insured or uninsured. That's your that's your cash price. Uh, forty five dollars for a vision visit $60 if you want to sit with a therapist, uh, $50 if you want to get your teeth cleaned, an exam, and, and uh, x-ray. So the, the reality is people say, well, we've had a bunch of people say, well, that's not sustainable. There's right. no way you can make those number work. And what I can actually tell you, they do work, but they require you to operate in a very different way. And, um, and so that's the journey we're on, which is, you know, can we get to the point where we can make those numbers work? Actually, what I would tell you is, um, you know, the, the push that we, we have had is, can you, 
can you even go further? You know, can, right. you know what is the ability? Like can free or giving us money to come in? Uh, I don't know that we'll ever go there, <laughs> but, but you know. But make, those numbers, do you, does Walmart, can Walmart make money? Absolutely, absolutely. And yeah, absolutely. Because a lot of it is your ability to drive volume, um, your ability to actually have the providers who are in there doing only care um, so that when they are working, the work they're doing is actually generating revenue. They're not like most primary care physicians who spend 40 50% of their time doing administrative work that generates no revenue and no return. Um, and so, you know, the challenge that we have is how do you actually figure out how to operate these spaces as efficiently and effectively as possible? And one of the things that we're testing, which is somewhat funny, um, when we went into it, we started asking questions, well, has anybody ever done a la you know, pricing elasticity studies on healthcare services? And what we could find is really no one has, because no one has ever asked the question, what if I lowered the price of this service by five yeah. or $10, how many more people would show up? Instead, what most people said is, how can I get five or 10 more dollars to do per this visit. per visit? And, and so one of our challenges is, we don't actually know you know, when you think about pent-up demand for volume in the market, we don't we don't even really know what that is. And so our, our sort of challenge is, can you price things, make money at that price, but actually see if you can generate the volume at that price as well. So how many of these will you open up if you are as successful? Yeah, what does scale? Like? What does scale mean for Walmart? Well, I, I, you how know, I think the question. I don't. Have? I don't know that I'm going to go on record and tell you how <laughs> okay. many we are. Does but here's it have what, a comma? What, I, yeah, what I'll tell you is this. I mean, it is. We believe there's enormous pent-up demand for a more efficient. Model. Yes. What I, in, uh, you look at the dramatic yes. dollars that are going to cash. Yep. The number of people who are uncovered. Yep. Folks who are walking through, frankly, the Walmart shopper. Hey, let the guy answer. Come on. Well, they, so, need, they need more. So I think it's pretty. I think the answer is pretty simple. There is not a community in which we operate today that does not need access to more affordable, more convenient, better, more accessible healthcare services. So you think about that. How, how many locations does Walmart operate between? the super centers and our division one stores and neighborhood markets and Sam's Club, you know, over 5,000. Could it be 5,000? I don't know. What I, what I can tell you is there's not a community where we operate where there's not that need. And so when you think about scale, I would also, beyond the sort of scale reality, there's also this just challenge that if we do something that's really good for one community, we have a hard time not doing it for the community that's next. You know, so one of the things that you think about with Walmart, this could go in any direction. You know, you have scale, you've got the price, you've got access. And of course, Walmart, you know, you weren't always in the grocery business, but you are now as yeah. the biggest grocer. Yep. And we're hearing a lot about social determinants of health. You yes. sometimes see a, a health system set up a farmer's market for access to fresh food, which I, I've always thought- It's tiny. Tiny, and it's like- pretty, And pretty you know, well, and pretty poorly run. Yeah, what kind of impact well, is that? So, yeah. I mean, is there a linkage here between the clinics and the stores, or is this just, I mean, is it a casual linkage? I mean, how does it work? No, actually, we think that there's going to be an enormous linkage. I think what we're already kind of seeing is this ability that, and, and we've kind of used an example <coughs> where, you know, imagine an individual who has some chronic illness, has either been diagnosed with that illness, now you sort of put them into a program where they've deli been delivered some kind of wellness service, maybe they sat with a nutritionist, now they, you know, now they've, uh, you're leading them through a journey to kind of help them be a smarter shopper. Now you've got an insurance plan who's willing to say, hey, if you can get them going on a better nutrition plan, I'm willing to help fund it. Um, that, that is it, right? I mean, I, we, 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 here's what I can tell you. We actually have today health insurers who are paying for car seats, bicycles, uh, HEPA filters, food, the, and because I think they're fast coming to this recognition that if you don't, if you're not playing a role in terms of impacting the behavior of the members and, and customers that are out there, then you're not going to sort of drive change. So our view is that actually is our great advantage, that all the things that an individual needs to be healthy, from the care services they need, and certainly the, the traditional kind of healthcare stuff, pharmaceuticals and the like, but also food, exercise, sleep, all those, those are all things that we are the biggest purveyors of, right? Yeah. You know, like tell people, we sell more than half the bikes that are yeah. used in the United States, and so our ability to impact the health of, of people in the community but, but, is critical. It would feel like food is is is, is one of the underutilized yes. superpowers yes. to actually improve wellness. How have you thought about how you're going to integrate food in the clinic yet, or are they two separate lines right now? Because it is you have the best prices. Yep. You've been able to provide great food at a very low price to folks who are on the border of not being able to afford it. How will how, do you have a vision for how you might integrate that into kind of those visits and that care and food and beverage? Yeah. 
So what I would say is, you know, certainly we, we use sort of the example of the community community wellness room that we have in there where we're actually doing nutrition classes, cooking classes for diabetics, those kind of things. So the idea of building a service that enables people to better, you know, better understand their nutrition and figure out how to, um, you know, cook healthier, eat healthier, those kind of things. The ability, so, so the short answer is yes. I mean, the way we sort of think about it is we're building a platform that enables you to kind of link all those parts. And so you think about other capabilities like online grocery pickup, which enables somebody to today go on a mobile phone, identify a set of items they want to order, and then drive to the store and somebody brings the kid out to their home. Moving to online grocery home delivery, where we actually go into your home and put the food in your refrigerator. Now you start to think about the ability to link a service, uh, maybe it's a traditional healthcare service or a nutritional service, linked to the ability to you know pre pre kit meals or pre-kit food for somebody who has a specific need and even deliver to their home, the idea that you can just do that all kind of, you know, set it and forget it, mm -hmm. um, that's exactly where we want to go mm -hmm. and I think where we see an enormous opportunity and where the assets that we have lend themselves very nicely. And how do you think about care to the home? Obviously at CareCentrics we're thinking a lot about yes. how we can shift more care yep. out of high cost into low cost. You've got a bunch of services that, that could actually augment and support that. Yep. How do you think about that as integrating or do you think of it, your care promotion is more episodic or do you sort of see it as continuous? No, I think it's, I think there's two things. One, we see it as continuous and we, two, we talk a lot about um, the world being omni-channel. And by omni-channel and integrated omni-channel, what we really mean by that is people who are only thinking about one channel with which to engage a consumer, be it in retail or in healthcare, I think have got it all wrong. And so for us, it's this idea of, so to the home becomes a critical component of this, which says, as you're thinking about trying to truly drive impact, some of it is going to be the ability to serve them through near site solutions. Yep. Some of it's going to be the ability to use digital solutions and just let them sort of control that experience themselves. Some of it's going to be our ability to actually go into your home and provide you some support. It might, it might be something simple, nothing more than uh, a, a kind of personal care assistant type mode, which says, do you have- super critical if you're, absolutely. If, you're, if, you're, if, you're if you're insecure. You're, yeah, yeah, do you have food in your refrigerator? Do you, do you, you know, if, do you even have a toilet, toilet paper on your toilet paper roll? Those things actually matter if, and, and so we recognize, for us, so care at home actually becomes a critical component of what we sort of envision the, the, the kind of, the, the full, ultimate, the, full the ultimate solution. But, yep, absolutely. Marcus, we've had some uh, guests on the show here at the conference that have been talking about mental health and access yes. to mental health. Yep. And you talked a bit about you know the variety of services that are offered. You talked about dental, and mental health is also offered. How? What yep. is your model for that? Because that's usually very expensive and hard to access. Well, that's the one for us. Um, as we mentioned, that's the one from a pricing perspective that's probably generated the most interest. We we priced. Uh, general therapy at a dollar uh, or a, a, a dollar a minute. So if you want to sit with a therapist and talk to them, it's about sixty dollars in Dallas, Georgia. To give you some perspective, if you were accessing, you should therapy, think about that, David, you because you could you could you could use a lot of minutes. Yeah. I'll pay you. You more. guys teaming up on me? Yeah, you could. yeah no, you could. he wouldn't. Listen, when it was a dollar fifty a minute, he wasn't offering. Yeah, yeah. Okay, let's just put it that way on the record. Well, but, it's, but it's a but it's a that 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 model is a game changer. It is in terms of access and price. I mean, I just yes. want to be very clear. We've talked a lot about how critically important access and availability is, yep. if you can provide that at scale, it's yes. a, it's, it will change that market. And well, and, and that's, that's sort of a good example of a business that most people don't really tend to think about scale and volume. And so what you tend to have is the therapists and social workers that we have there are wildly underutilized. Yep. And so our challenge is says, we know, I mean, this is, these are the facts. You know, people who are, who are dealing with chronic illness, most of them are also dealing with diagnosed or undiagnosed behavioral health issues. Uh, we, we claim that there's not an ability to address their needs. In fact, there's more than enough capacity of people who can deliver behavioral health uh, solutions in the market. It's the challenge of- No one agrees with you here. They think we have to add more supply, add more dollars. You're, uh, sa you're, you're saying, can you say go, that go, again? Go, go, do the, go do the count of how many social workers are, have people who have graduated with degrees in social work exist in the United States. We, we, there are lots. It's just they are in the wrong place. You have put them where people aren't. Now put them where people are and then actually make it accessible by saying, I'm not going to price this at $142 an hour. I'm going to price this at 60 bucks an hour. I'm not going to make 
uh, addiction treatment support programs be wildly inaccessible. I'm going to make them accessible because they're going to be where you are. I'm going to, I'm, and so a lot of it, I think for us, I, what I will tell you is I think part of the issue we've had in behavioral health is we're still embarrassed about it. We still view sort of behavioral stigma, health with that stigma. And, and so we aren't willing to kind of put it front and center because we don't think the people uh, want to sort of engage it. Instead, what we see is the exact opposite. When we sort of talk about these services, um, people are more, you know, more than excited, more glad to kind of engage in them, really? saying, you know, thank you for actually bringing them to us because I didn't even know how to where to find them. So, yeah. a lot of it is it, it is that sort of access channel. Did you? Great. No, I saw. The last question to well, you, John. No, I, I'm being I polite think, I, now that I, you've I, offered I, to pay for my treatment. <laughs> no. I feel like I need to let you well, have the last I think, word. You know, you know, Marcus, you've been at the leader of uh, of a movement um, of one of the best retailers in the world. It's created all kinds of new consumer models. It's changed the way a lot of consumers actually access retail. You've also been in healthcare for a long time. What's the most important lesson retail can teach healthcare? What's, so you, oh. you've got, we've got, I don't know, 10,000 people here yep. all coming up with new business models that are that they claim to be bending the cost curve, yep. but they didn't say which direction. <laughs> they did not say that. <laughs> That's exactly. What can retail teach healthcare? Well, and it was fun. I'm actually going to, my answer is going to be based on that. Okay. What, that what, I would t what I tell you is that traditionally the models that we sort of seen are either, the, you have groups who say, we, we, we have driven enormous success, except you look at it and say, well, you can only get 1% engagement. Or they say, we get a lot of engagement. And you're like, yeah, but you're like Fitbit. Within 30 days, nobody's, your, your no Fitbit's bit. been thrown in a drawer and nobody's using yeah. you, right? Um, what I would say is, I think probably two things that, that retail brings is, we actually, we live, because it is so hyper competitive, we live in fear of the, our demise every day. And that yeah. is not a problem for most large healthcare it, institutions. It, it, it really is not. And so that fear basically forces you to say, what am I doing to engage the consumer better today than I did before because I'm afraid somebody else is going to beat me there. And so that that sort of that that kind of complete focus on driving complete scaled engagement becomes critical. I think the second thing is just quite frankly, and we talk a lot about this, that most of the healthcare system operates under this uh, it sounds a little academic, but I'll call it the balance interest paradigm that says uh, the best solutions are those in which all the needs of the key groups are addressed. As long as you address the needs of the patient and the payer and the provider, and in some cases, the product manufacturers, pharma and device manufacturers, then you've got a great solution. I think what retail can teach healthcare is that is bull. If you want to build a solution that works, there's only one group that matters, it's the consumer. Everybody else serves that consumer, and if you want to build things that, that are successful, that's what you do. In fact, what we've seen is the groups who've done that, there are two things. One is they generate the greatest success. Two, they end up benefiting the payers and the providers. Even though they had a complete focus on the consumer, the benefits that accrued to the rest of the groups was greater than those who were designing. It's a system effect. Yes, that's right. And so I think this, this kind of just belligerent focus on the needs of the consumer um, is it, that is a sort of that is a critical or necessary perspective to bring to the healthcare solutions development debate that I think is missing, and, and so that's why I, I think it's exciting to see Amazon and CVS and Walgreens and Walmart and Kroger and Costco and others and all the other little guys and Alibaba yeah. and whoever else yeah. that, you know who's going to sort of come in because that's the that's the sort of filter they bring. Mm -hmm. Well, thank you to Marcus Osborne, VP of Healthcare Wellness. Wellness, transformation, transformation of healthcare or wellness or both? Well, I'll do it all. Health and wellness transformation at Walmart. Uh, you can see all of the special series that we're doing at Health 2019 on your YouTube playlist or listen on your favorite podcast service. And remember, whatever you do, subscribe to Care Talk so you'll never miss another episode. Subscribe now. Thank you. Hey there, listeners. Want more Care Talk? There's more to be had in our other episodes, so be sure to look for those and subscribe to CareTalk on your favorite service.